I want to talk to you about overcoming giants because, um, and when I say giants, I'm not talking about physical giants unless you have, unless you're a father of, of someone who's over six foot and physically dominates you all the time. I'm not sure if I can help you with that because I constantly get beaten up on a regular basis. Um, Trinity gave birth to my own personal bully in the form of my 19-year-old son. Uh, I want to talk about spiritual giants, because we all face spiritual giants, right? Is anybody, let's be honest in the room right now, is anybody here right now, you're, you're facing a bit of a spiritual giant, there's, there's some real pushback on your life. If you don't have your hand up, then you're obviously doing nothing. Because I've learned this, you're either going into the storm, or you're in a storm, or you just come out of a storm, and you're about to go into a storm. I, I just think God uses storms, or God uses stuff to transform us. And so I want to talk today about overcoming giants, and I, I want to look at the David and Goliath story. I just want to pull four things out that maybe you haven't seen before, but before we get into that, I'm going to give you a brief overview of the David and Goliath story, and so we're going to read a bunch of scripture, which I know, you know might be a struggle for some of you, but we'll be all right, all right? Are you ready to go? Oots is ready. All right. 1 Samuel 17, 1 to 11 says, Now the Philistines gathered their forces of war and assembled at... I'm not going to try and pronounce some of these names, okay? So we're just going to move along. Um, In Judah, and they pitched their camp in this place, between this place and that other place. And Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah, and they drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill, and the Israelites the other hill with the valley in between them. And a champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. Let's just say he was about 10 feet tall, okay? He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels, just really heavy. On his legs he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. It's, It's heavy. His shield went ahead of him. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you are the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said that... uh, uh, Then the Philistines said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Verse 16. For 40 days the Philistine came forward every morning and every evening and took his stand. 40 days. Does anybody else know what happened after 40 days? Come on. What else has got 40 to do with 40 days? I can't hear you. Jesus was in the desert for what? 40 days and 40 nights and then he was tempted. How how many nights was the ark? 40 is an important number. Verse 22, David left his things with the keeper of the supplies, ran to the battle lines and asked his brothers how they were. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stood Uh, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance and David heard it. Whenever the Israelites saw the man, they all fled from him in great fear. Here's the thing that's going to burst your bubble if you think David is awesome. It says all of Israel, whenever they heard him, fled in fear, including David. Come on. Because we read it and we think, oh, all the Israelites were scared, but David stepped up to the plate. Not straight away. David ran in fear too which is good for you and I, because it means it's okay to be fearful the first time we face a a Goliath. But it also means that we can overcome our fear and face a Goliath and take it down. Come on. You are real quiet today. David said to Saul in verse 32, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you are not able to go out against a Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off the sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When I when it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both 
lion and bear, this uncircumcised Philistine will be one of them. And uh, funny, that's like, that's like a major like abusive comment. You're uncircumcised. It's like, you know, nowadays I would call them a beep, 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 beep. But back then it was like, you're uncircumcised. <laughs> Sorry, that's just my sense of humor. We'll be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the poor of the lion and the poor of the bear will rescue me from the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put on a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around. Because he was not used to them, he says, I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I am not used to them. So he took them off, then he took, off, took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with a sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. Verse 43, we're getting there. Goliath said to David, am I a dog that you would come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the wild animals. And David said to the Philistine, you come against me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I will strike you down and cut off your head. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran towards the battle line to meet him. Him, reached into his bag, taking out a stone, he slung it and struck this Philistine in the forehead and Goliath said, something has passed my mind. That was a good dad joke. The stone sunk into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. We know this is a God thing because if you've ever been struck in the forehead, you don't fall forward, you fall backwards. So we know it's a God thing, because I picture as this, is that David's flung his stone, which hit Goliath in the forehead, but God was standing behind Goliath and kicked him down as he got hit. You see, the David and Goliath story has become an iconic story, not just in the church, but in all of society, about the underdog overcoming impossible circumstances, right? We all love a David and Goliath story, don't we? Yeah. One of my favorite movies is The Blind Side because it takes this young kid from a real troubled background and he becomes a, a champion gridiron player and this family helps. We, we love that. We love the feel-good story where somebody overcomes their greatest obstacle and manages to accomplish great things. And the David and Goliath story has become this iconic story of, of language, of an improbable victory, of how David never should have won this, but somehow he won it. And, and, and you know, he's uh, the ultimate underdog. My problem with this version of events or my problem with this thinking that David is the ultimate underdog that overcomes an improbable situation is that I think the Bible teaches that it's not an underdog story. That it's not an improbable victory. In fact, I would suggest that just about every part of this story, the way that we've interpreted it over the years is incorrect. I think it's an underdog story because nobody thinks David has a chance because Goliath is so large. And I think that we have, uh, we think power in terms of physical might. When it comes to things, we, we look at things and we think power in, times, in terms of physical size and might. And here's my problem. If we look, continue to look at things or a size of a situation or a size of a circumstance or a size of a giant that we may be facing, if we continue to make the mistake thinking that size is power, we will continue to operate in error when it comes to the things of God and we will suffer the consequences of wrong thinking about what our circumstance really is. You see, what Israel saw from the ridge was an intimidating giant, but powerful and strong are not always as they seem. You know, the scripture says this, that the devil walks around like, like a roaring lion. He, he, he roars like a lion, but he's not a lion. He intimidates by, by projecting size and power, but he's actually powerless. Because Jesus said, I have all power and all authority, and I've given it to you. 
He is a toothless, roaring person without any power, but he presents himself in a way that is intimidating because he shows size and a, and a view of power when he's actually not powerful at all. Are you with me today? You see, the Israelites think they know who Goliath is because they size him up and jump to conclusions about what they think he is capable of, but they don't really see him. And so I want to pull some things out of that story that will hopefully help you to understand when the enemy comes or when giants come your way. These four things I hope will help you to understand that you are not an underdog. You are not in an improbable situation. In fact, the enemy is always the underdog. Wow. How many here actually believe that the enemy is the underdog in every situation that you face? If you're a Christ follower, if you have been saved and delivered and he is your Lord and Savior, how many here, if we're really honest, how many here actually believe that the enemy is the underdog and we're the conquerors? Hopefully by the end of this, all of you will discover this. The first thing I want to talk to you about in this story is is gateways. Gateways. The valley that David and Goliath fought in offered a clear path through the cities of Hebron, Bethlehem, and Jerusalem. Hebron, Bethlehem, and Jerusalem were the strongholds of Israel. They were the fortified places of Israel. You have to understand that Goliath and the Philistines did not line up outside of Hebron. They did not line up outside of Bethlehem. And they did not line up outside of Jerusalem because they were strongholds and they were impenetrable. And so therefore, we, 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 there's no point us lining up outside of those because we just can't break into them. So what they did is they lined up in the valley that gave access to the strongholds. The enemy will always come at you in your weaknesses because the enemy understands that through your weaknesses he gets access to your strongholds. I need you to hear me this morning because I don't think you believe me. They've come to the valley because they know if they win in the valley, then they get access to the strongholds. They know they can't overcome the strongholds, but they know that they can possibly get them in the weaknesses. It's not that the enemy is interested in your weaknesses. You know the enemy doesn't care about your weaknesses because they're your weaknesses, and he knows that you have them, and he's happy for you to have the weaknesses. He doesn't come after your weaknesses. He comes after your strongholds, and the way that he gets to your strongholds is via your weaknesses. If anybody's a parent in the place, the way that the, if I was going to come after you when I was your enemy, I would have come after you via your children. Why? Because children are always our weakness as parents. Come on. The enemy is not going to come after your strongholds like intentionally surrounding the strongholds. He understands that if he comes via your weaknesses, then he'll get access to your strongholds. The enemy attacks in the valley because he wants access to the strongholds. The stuff that you're, you, you're held on to, believe in, that you're, you don't budge on, you don't shake from those things. He, he realizes that he can't tack them straight on, but he knows that if he comes via your valleys or via your weaknesses, that he'll get access to your strongholds. And that's why he waits for you to get to your lowest point because he's not after your weakness, he's after the stronghold. Hence why Jesus fasted for 40 days and then the enemy comes to tempt him while he was at his weakness. Why? Because he wanted to get to his strongholds because look at the challenges. If you are the son of God, that was a stronghold for Jesus because when he got baptized by John the Baptist, the spirit descended like a dove and a voice from heaven came, this is my son in whom 
whom I am well pleased. He has a stronghold of knowing that he is a son of the Most High God. You have a stronghold of knowing that you're a son and daughter of the Most High God, that you are co-heir with Christ, that you are seated with him in heavenly places, that you've been saved, delivered. And he's not gonna come at that stronghold, but he's gonna wait until you have a weak moment to challenge your stronghold. And then he will question everything about your stronghold. He's not actually interested in your weakness. He wants your stronghold and he knows that the way to your stronghold is for your weakness because when he challenges your weaknesses, it causes you to doubt your stronghold. Are you, are you hearing me today? Here's the thing. The devil couldn't give a rip about your weakness. He's after your stronghold. But God cares hugely about your weakness. I'm going to say something in a minute, and I hope this bursts your brains a little bit. God understands that the enemy's avenue to your stronghold is via your weaknesses. So Paul says that I will boast in my weaknesses... Because in my weaknesses, his strength becomes perfect. <laughs> I don't think you're getting this. The enemy comes after your weaknesses to get access to your stronghold. God comes after your weaknesses to turn them into his stronghold. I don't think you got that. God comes after your weaknesses and makes his strength perfect in your weakness so that your weakness becomes his stronghold, not your stronghold, but his stronghold. And that's why David can say, the battle belongs to the Lord because he understands that my weakness is not my weakness. My weakness becomes his stronghold because his strength becomes perfect in my weakness. And instead of me stressing him about my weakness, I'm gonna hand it over to God. I'm gonna trust him, I'm going to boast that it's because of him. I may be weak, but I'm saved. I may be weak, but he saved me, delivered me, transformed me. I may be weak, but he's Jehovah Jireh. I may be weak, but he's Jehovah Rapha. I know who he is. And then my weakness becomes God's stronghold. And then the enemy doesn't have a foothold because he can't overcome the stronghold that God has created in your weakness. I'm sorry, I thought that was really cool. And this is why, even though you think you're in your weakest moment, you can turn around and say, oh, you come after me with a spear and a javelin and a sword, but I come after you in the name of the Lord, because what you think is my weakness is actually his stronghold. Isn't that cool? He'll always come after you in your weak areas because he wants access to your strongholds. But if you would be open and honest with God about your weaknesses and hand them over to him, he will make them his stronghold. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't work on it. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't do something about it. Like just don't worry, oh, I have a weakness of pornography. Oh, well, it's all right, it's the Lord's stronghold. No, you want, to, you, want to, you want to do something, but you need to trust God when you're in your weakest moment and the enemy is causing you to doubt everything that you've always believed, he's coming after your strongholds, you need to understand, hold on, I don't need to stress about my weaknesses. I can boast in my weaknesses, not boast about how weak I am, but boast about how strong he is in my weaknesses. First thing you need to understand, it's always gateways. You always come through the valley of your weaknesses to go after your strongholds. The second thing that I need you to understand is no hand-to-hand. -hand. No hand-to-hand -hand combat. The, the enemy wants you to get up close and personal. You see here with Goliath, um, the Philistine sends his greatest warrior down into the valley to resolve the deadlock one-on-one. -on -one. The, the enemy always wants to get you one-on-one. -on -one. He, he, he wants to isolate you one-on-one -on -one because he understands this, that a coal outside of the fire gets cold. 
He understands that if he can get you outside of the family of God, if he can get you outside of your friendships, if he can get you outside of your network, and he can isolate you, and then he can go one-on-one. And one-on-one, it's, it's pretty tough. But when he comes against the body of Christ or the bride of Christ, he doesn't have a hope in hell. Excuse the pun. He wants to isolate you Because he knows that if he isolates you, then you're going to go cold. And so Goliath was expecting a warrior to come out or come forward that would have hand-to-hand combat for him. He never thought the battle would be fought any other way because this is who he was. So he prepared accordingly because he was a hand-to-hand guy. He was a guy who'd been trained from young to fight hand-to-hand, one-on-one combat. His armor protected him for blows against his body. All his weapons were for close contact, hand-to-hand fighting. All his weapons were designed to pierce swords, uh, pierce shields and armor. So. Everything about him was to try and get this person one-on-one, isolate them, and defeat them. The the, the enemy only has one plan for you and I, and that is to get you one-on-one, isolated, and then lie to you. That's all he has. All the weapons he has in his arsenal is to lie to you and try to get you to believe his lies. The Bible says this, that, that Lucifer or Beelzebub or the devil is the father of lies. In fact, it says that lying is his native tongue. It's the only weapon that he has is to constantly tell you lies to create doubt in your strength strongholds. He doesn't have any other weaponry. Goliath had no other options. It had to be one-on-one, hand-to-hand, or, he, or, or, or nothing, because he, he, arch, he wasn't good at archery, because he didn't have a bow and arrow. He wasn't good at slinging, because he didn't have a sling like David. All he had was hand-to-hand combat material. He was wanting to get somebody one-on-one and fight them. And so Saul Saul assumed that David was going to fight hand-to-hand as well. And that's why he offered David his armor. But David says, no thanks. I'm not going to use that. I'm going to use my staff and my sling. And he picked up five stones. Have you ever wondered why he picked up five stones? This is just my theory. I can't prove it publicly, but this is just my theory. I think he picked up five stones because it spells J-E-S-U-S. It's my thought. And his sling, which he was to use to fight Goliath. Goliath is in his heavy infantry, thinks he's going to fight someone in heavy infantry. And that's why he says to me, come to me so I can give your flesh to the birds and to, birds of the air and beasts of the field. He, he wanted David to accept a fight at close quarters. Here's the thing. Don't get sucked in from him when he's trying to isolate you and get you one-on-one because we don't fight like that. When it comes to the kingdom, we don't fight one-on-one. We don't fight for victory. We fight from victory. We fight from the victory that Jesus has provided for us. 2 Corinthians 10.3 says this, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of this world. On the contrary, we have divine power to demolish strongholds. Ephesians 6.12 says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. First, Second Chronicles 20.15 says, He said, Listen, King Jehoshaphat, and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you, do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army for the battle is not yours 
but God's. You see, the problem is when you think that it's your battle, you'll get isolated and you'll get one-on-one with him just like he wants. And you'll go hand-to-hand combat, trying to defeat the giant in your own strength, in your own ability, trying to defeat the stuff that's coming against your family in your own strength, in your own ability. But we don't fight how the enemy fights. We don't fight hand-to-hand. We don't fight in close quarters. No, no, no. We stand back and we understand that the battle belongs to the Lord and I don't do the fighting, He does the fighting for me. And then my tools are not hand-to-hand combat, but they're prayer and worship and the Word. And all I need to do is fling the rock that is Jesus towards the circumstance and He'll do the fighting. He'll be the one who wins the battle. It's not my battle because my, my weaknesses aren't made strong, but His strength is made perfect in my weaknesses. And so I don't need to fight one on one. I don't need to isolate myself. I don't need to take him on. That's not my job. The battle belongs to the Lord. I send him to fight my battles. I send him to stand up to Goliath. And that's why David said, you come at me with this, but I come at you in the name of the Lord. Because David knew it wasn't his fight. And you're not going to engage me and you're not going to force me into this. You're not going to manipulate me into it. And you're not going to push me into trying to take you on. No, no, I stand back and I pray and I worship and I trust he whose strength is my perfect and my weaknesses. He'll try to get you to go one-on-one. He'll try to get you to isolate. But you just around and say, no, 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 that's not how I fight. Oh, devil. You don't understand. Your fight is not with me. Your fight is with him. Are you hearing me today? The enemy wants to get up and close and personal, but don't engage with him. That's not how we fight. Understand that he always comes through your weaknesses, but you don't have to stress about that. You just need to trust God in that and cry out to him because God will make your weaknesses his stronghold. Don't go one-on-one with him. Don't isolate. Don't let him pull you to one side. We don't fight that way. We fight with prayer and the word and worship. That's how we fight. The third thing I want you to understand about this story is spick savers. Spick savers. Goliath says this, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? Did David have sticks? He had a staff, he had a sling, but David didn't have any sticks. This thing I need you to understand about Goliath and I need you to understand about the enemy that we face. Goliath had vision problems. The enemy has vision problems. He says, Goliath says, come to me, come to me, come close to me. I need you to come to me close because otherwise I can't locate you. Come close to me. You see, the enemy has a vision problem. How do you know that, Craig? Because Jeremiah 29, 11 says, for I know the plans I have for you. The enemy doesn't know the plans that God has for you. The enemy can't see your future. The enemy can only see your moment. And he needs you close so that he can see what's going on because he doesn't have an ability to see your tomorrow or your next week or your next month or your next year. God has the ability that God sees the end from the beginning. And even though we might be stressing over here because we've got a Goliath, God understands that we're going to defeat it. And when you defeat it, you're going to end up being King David. And this is going to be really, really, really awesome. But in that moment, David didn't know he was going to be King one day. He may have had it prophesied over him, but man, I had lots of stuff prophesied over me too. And I don't know about you, but circumstances and stuff around my life always causes me to doubt the outcome of the plans that he has for me. But you need to understand this about the enemy. He can't see the plans that God has for you. He can't locate you in your future because he only ever has access to your past. 
The enemy will try to convince you that it has a vision for your future by telling you, oh, if this happens, your marriage is going to fall apart. If that happens, you're going to end up uh, you know, in all sorts of financial stress. Oh, the doctor said you've got cancer, so that means that your life is about to end. The enemy will try to convince you that he has an ability to see into your future, but Goliath and the enemy has a vision problem. They can't see you properly unless you are up close, and this is why we don't do hand-to-hand. This is why we don't get up close because what we have the ability to do because we serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is we have the ability to look past the giants and see our future. Hence why David said, this day I will be cutting your head off. Why? Because David could see the plans and the future that God had for him, but the enemy could not locate the future because the enemy doesn't have any ability for vision. Are you with me today? Well, uh, good preaching. I don't know about you, but that gives me great hope. And once again, he's going to lie and he's going to make out that he knows your future. Why? Because he wants to get access to your stronghold. That's why any time you get a prophecy, you should write it down and file it. So every time you start to doubt what God wants to do with your life, you can pull your prophecy file out and read all the things that God has spoken over your life. I've got it on my laptop. I read it regularly. Because believe it or not, sometimes pastoring, you feel like you're failing, and it's a good idea to read the prophetic words that God has for you. Especially when God's moving at his pace instead of our pace. He has a vision problem. He has an inability to locate him unless he's up close. How do you know the enemy has a vision problem, Craig? Because the enemy believed by killing Jesus, it would bring him victory. Because he didn't have a vision understanding that in killing Jesus, God would use that death to establish Christ as our Lord and Saviour and give us victory. See, the enemy can't see that. He thought, man, I've killed Christ, this is all over. And God said him back, oh, I'm the one that sees the end from the beginning. And this is, this, is, this is not you winning, this is you losing. And guess what? You're doing it for me. You're doing the work for me. You, have, you are doing exactly what I expected you to do and everything is going to plan. Why? Because the devil couldn't see the future. He has no vision. Your enemy has no vision. He'll try to convince you, but he has no vision. We have a future and a hope. We have an ability to see past our giants. We have God's plans for us, which are good, because the Bible says that every good thing comes from God. The Bible says this, that that, that all things work together for good for those who love God and accord according to his purpose. So even though the enemy is trying to tell us that our future is covered in disaster, we can say, oh, no, 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 our future is covered in good because God can't sin and God can't do me harm. God can only do me good. And if I trust him and stay with him and I hand over my weaknesses to him, oh, the circumstance may look like chaos right now. It may look like you're killing Jesus, but actually you're giving me a victory in my future. Goliath was blind to his approach, and the next minute he was down, too big and too slow and too blurry-eyed to comprehend the way the tables had turned on him. And if you're really not convinced that we're not underdogs in this whole story when it comes to defeating the enemy, then my last point will hopefully help you. And that is this, slingers beat infantry. Slingers beat infantry. We are not underdogs. The biggest lie the enemy has sold us is that we are underdogs, that somehow we are weaker than him, that somehow he is more powerful than him, but we are sons and daughters of the Most High. We are co-heirs with Christ. All authority he has, he has given to us. We are not the underdogs. We have never been the underdogs. We will never ever be the underdogs. As long as we hold on to Christ and we use our weapons of warfare, which is prayer, the word and worship, we will always win. We will always conquer because he can't defeat those things. He doesn't have the authority. 
Slingers in those days were always used against infantry. Them and arch, archers were always used against infantry. Have you ever seen those, those old movies like um, Braveheart or whatever, you know? And, and, and they're miles apart from each other. And they're, Aah! and that's when it, archers, you know, and the arrows are going. And they go, you know, getting hit by arrows. And they're being killed. And you're like, you guys are dumb. Like, you know they have archers. Like, it doesn't make sense to me, right? Like, have, I don't know, have a big shield like on the drum kit and stick it up over your head. (laughs) Can't get me now. You know, like when you see those old ones, like the the Patriot and uh, with Mel Gibson, and they're walking, you know, their guns towards each other, and cannons are being fired at them left, right, and centre. Like you guys are dumb in an open field, and then one comes through and takes someone's leg off. Ah! It's like are you like cannons, archers, slingers? Always kill infantry without being touched. Slingers back in those days could hit a target from a distance of up to 200 meters. How's your up close and personal stuff working for you now, Goliath? You see, David had no intention of doing hand to hand combat, he had no intention of being up and close. He doesn't tell Saul that he killed the lion and the bear as a testimony of his courage, but to point out how he intends to fight Goliath the same way he fought the animals as a slinger. Remember he said he chased after them and he struck them and then he killed them. He is showing him this is how I'm going to win. I'm not going to fight him one on one. That would be stupid. But what I am going to do is I'm going to be a slinger because slingers always beat infantry. Because I can hit a target from 200 metres away. You see, you can get up close with the enemy or you can just fire prayers from a distance. You can just fire the word of God from a distance. You can just fire worship from a distance. You can send the Archangel Michael to fight on your behalf. You have the ability and the authority to not have to get up close. You are a slinger and slingers always beat infantry. As long as we understand we're slingers and we don't try to man up and be, I can do this. No, you can't do this. You can't defeat the enemy. If you could defeat the enemy, there would be no point on Jesus dying on the cross. You can't defeat him. He's defeated him. Jesus has made a public spectacle of him. And now you need to fight as a slinger and understand that Jesus is the one that will go hand to hand and toe to toe. We are the slingers. We don't get up and close and personal. And that doesn't make us underdogs. That makes us more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. Because we always win. Because the enemy needs us up and close. He needs us isolated, but we don't isolate. And we don't get up and close. Because we understand David was not the underdog. Goliath is the underdog. He can run towards Goliath because he doesn't have armor that will slow him down and stop his maneuverability. And he aims the projectile at Goliath's forehead Interestingly, the forehead was the only point of vulnerability on Goliath. He slung the stone, they estimate, at a speed of 120 kilometers an hour. This allows Goliath one second to do something. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm going to be turning 52 this month. And I feel like Goliath a lot of the time now. Slow and hard to move. He had one second to react and protect himself before the stone hit him, which he would have been unable to do because of the heavy armour and the fact that he was stationary waiting for hand-to-hand combat. He watched David approach first with scorn. He come at me like a dog with sticks, then with surprise. And then what could only... (laughs) 
be described as horror as he realized this battle was not what he expected. Can you imagine? You come up with your sticks, I'm going to slaughter you. Then he sees the stone coming towards him and he's like, and then the stone hits him and it's like, And then David walks up, pulls out Goliath's sword, which was really heavy. Maybe, maybe it was too heavy, so he just pulled his chainsaw out of his back pocket. <laughs> as he cut the head off. The Bible says that David then took the head home to show his mum, Mum, look! Some of you are worried about what your kids pick up on the way home from school. <laughs> David's mum cleaned it up, cleaned it out, and turned it into a pot plant holder. I'm not sure. He says, you come against me with a sword and a spear, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. In other words, he's saying, bro, you picked the fight with me, but it's not with me. You defied God. That's how I know I'm going to win, because he fights my battles. David was a slinger, and slingers always beat. Inventory, Romans chapter 8, verses 31 to 32, 35 and 37 says, If God is for us, who can? He did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all of these things we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. Shall our weaknesses, shall our fears, shall our insecurities, shall our anxiety defeat us? No, because we are more than conquerors in Christ. Jesus, when his strength becomes perfect and my weaknesses, I become more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. Not in my ability, not in my strength, not in my securities, but in my weaknesses, he becomes my stronghold. My weaknesses become his stronghold and then I become a hupakaneo, an overcomer. That's what the Greek word says, an overcomer, a hupakaneo. And I hope I said that right. It means to vanquish people beyond recognition. It's not just a, I had a little win. No, it's to vanquish beyond recognition. It means to gain a decisive victory. It means exceedingly more than a conqueror. Can I tell you, with Christ, you are hyperkaneo. You are more than a conqueror. You're not your weaknesses. As long as we say, God, you need to come and make my weaknesses your stronghold. I thank you that your strength is made perfect in my weakness. Then you become a hyperkaneo. And when the enemy comes towards you, you go, oh, we don't fight one-on-one. We don't do hand-to-hand. I come at you in the name of the Lord of the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. Your battle is with Him. The battle belongs to the Lord. And you can try and come through my weaknesses, but they're His strongholds. You are not just going to eke out a little victory. You are going to demolish the opposition as someone comes and jumps on the keys. Or not. I think Maddie's out. It's okay. Don't stress. I can do it without keys. I know keys helps create this... But I'm pretty sure I can just do that with my good looks and great personality. (laughs) You're going to demolish strongholds. You're going to demolish opposition if you fight his way, not your way. The enemy will always come in your weaknesses to attack your strongholds. He will always try to get you isolated one-on-one because he knows he can't beat you outside of that. But we don't fight that way. We don't fight up close. We fight from a distance. Why? Because it's not our battle. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we understand that we're not underdogs. We always win. 
the slingers always beat infantry. Come on, I don't know about you, but that excites me. We, like David, fire the rock, Jesus Christ, at the enemy. Like Jesus in the desert, we fire the word of God at our giants. We don't engage in hand-to-hand combat because we're slingers. Slingers always beat infantry. We're not underdogs because we don't use the weapons of this world. We use the weapons of prayer, word, and worship. And so when I feel like I'm under attack, I worship. When I feel like I'm under attack, I pray. When I feel like I'm under attack, I read the word. Not because I'm trying to defeat the enemy, but because I am engaging in my weakness with the strength of God. And then I ask him, Father, would you fight the battles for me? The battle belongs to the Lord. When the enemy comes in like a flood, comma, God raises up a standard against it. Not you, not me, but God. But I have to, when my weaknesses go, Father, I need you. I can't do this. I don't have this. But I thank you in your word that I'm in the palm of your hand and no one can take me out. I thank you that in your word that says that our weapons are not of this world, but they're mighty for destroying strongholds. I thank you, God, that your word says that when I send word out, it goes out and it accomplishes everything it's set out to do and it doesn't return empty. I thank you, God, that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. It doesn't mean that weapons won't be formed, they just won't prosper. It doesn't mean that the the enemy like Goliath won't come out and roar at me for 40 days trying to get me engaged, but I don't need to engage because, because the battle belongs to the Lord. The problem is for all of us, and I include myself in this, Because whether we like it or not, we're all secretly control freaks and we want to control our lives. And so when we go through a tough circumstance or a tough situation, we try to resolve it within our own strength and we just play into the enemy's hands. We need to understand this, without Christ, I can do nothing. But with Christ, all things are possible. So I'm not going to engage with the enemy when I'm facing a giant. I'm going to engage with the Lord of the armies of Israel. Are you hearing me today? You don't need to fight your battles. The battle belongs to the Lord. Let me just close our eyes just for a moment in this place.